Welcome back everyone. Thanks for tuning in again. A great response to our first and last week's first podcast, video audio podcast. And as promised, we're back following up with Barry. Thanks for joining us again, mate. Oh, thanks for having us again, Rob. It was uh, genuinely great feedback and great to see the concern of hunters uh, regarding the advocacy and a lot of the issues that were going on in the deer hunting space. This one we're following up with some of the questions and uh, a couple of the, the open ends, I guess, from last week and are going to close them up and then also concentrate on a very important rundown or lead up into the election, which is now only 48 hours away. So again, going to go through uh, a lot of the ADA's advocacy issue and, and uh, where they're looking to, um, to, to advise and um, inform hunters on their vote leading into the election. And then I'm uh, very happy to say we're going to Skype in with Daniel Young, a Shooters, Fishers and Farmers member for Northern Victoria, who's done a lot for hunting and we're going to, uh, he's hard on the campaign trail and he's going to pull over in his car and we're going to check in for a video call and go through some of uh, the key uh, factors and you know important issues for them leading into Saturday's election. So Barry, let's get straight into it. Um, the Parks Cull is, oh, is and was a hot topic amongst Victorian hunters. Uh, it received a lot of interest and feedback on the first podcast. Can you, you followed up with a meeting, I believe, the last few days, which was a closure to that, or you? Well, not along? quite closure, but <laughs> no. yeah, we, we had a long meeting with Parks, more generally about the deer control programs and and the ongoing involvement um, on the aerial stuff. Disappointingly, they didn't provide us with the financial figures that we've been asking for. So. Right. Um, something they promised to do and something we'll keep pushing for and we'll get. Were they hiding something, do you think? Or um, just weren't organised? Maybe a bit of both. Mm. I'm not sure. Um, honestly, not sure. There was the stuff, you know, they referred in the meeting to the stuff published in the Weekly Times and I made the point. They're saying, oh, well, you know, we've got to get good information out there. And I said, yeah, but you've got to get information out there because at the moment, you leave a vacuum, people fill the vacuum. Yeah. And those vacuums are getting filled with misinformation. Yeah, we, wrote, right. we rode that point really hard home to Parks Vic. I'm pretty sure it was taken on board. They were talking about working with, with us and the Sporting Tutors Association on a communications strategy. And there was a pretty broad acknowledgement that on all these programs, on the Bogong High Plains and the Howitt stuff, they haven't done a good enough job of communicating with the hunting community. Yeah. Uh, some of this stuff's really necessary and they haven't done a good enough job of communicating why it's necessary. Yeah, well, there's virtually no communication to start with, was there? Really? No, no, so and and you know, Parks have acknowledged that. They've said, oh, we've had a had a communication strategy, and um, Steve Garlick, who you know was with me at the meeting, um, Steve's not known for holding back in his opinions. And Steve pointed out, he asked the question, was that an internal strategy? And they sort of said, well, yeah. Uh -huh. He said, well, here's the problem. You know, we're, mm. we're communicating with 40,000 deer hunters out there in the community. Yeah. And you're not, and you're losing trust. Yes, yes, that's a valid point. Okay. So it's a watch this space, I'm afraid. Um, mm -hmm. As soon as we'll keep holding people accountable, which is what we do. Okay. Well, and let you know when we've got the answers. Very good, very good. Now, as I said, 48 hours coming down to the big day on Saturday. Make no mistake, some of the decisions that are made on Saturday and how people's vote goes will directly impact hunting opportunities and the outcomes for hunters in the future. Uh, we have so many people opposed to our way of life and what we do, they're all biting at our heels, they'll never leave us alone. ADA, you put out a great email uh, advising uh, people how to go about, how to think about the election, how to think about placing their vote and how you'd basically held both parties accountable and what you think the options were out there. It was a very well formulated email and really I just want to go through that with you today because all the details were done and uh, it were done very well and there's nothing more we can really add to that because it was so perfectly done. But let's start with how you've, you, you know, where you, where you think both major parties stand. Um, with the major parties they both stand pretty well in the middle yeah and I think both of them would prefer to avoid talking about our issues if they could yeah okay um, you know, there's inconvenient people who like us who want yeah. it to be an issue there's also people who are opposed to us who want it to be an issue yeah but I suspect that both major parties if they had the choice would happily go through election campaigns without talking about hunting at all and for the most part they have mm-hmm 
Yeah, we both, you know, uh, we're both family men. We've got families. We've got young kids. We, we're both uh, employed. There's employment issues, there's mortgage issues, there's all sorts of issues. Uh, we understand that everyone isn't going to vote solely on, you know, on, with 100% of their focus on hunting. And that's completely understandable. But for the purposes of this podcast, we are going to focus on what these parties do for hunting because yeah. it's, a, it's a huge topic, the election. So, and the election. So excuse us if, uh, you know, if that's not your thing and that's totally fine. And we can't tell and we won't tell anyone how to vote. But when it comes to those that are concerned about their hunting vote, it can make a big difference when they vote right. Uh, so coming, going through the parties, you said that there's both some middle ground here. Um, you've got uh, some links on, on the website in that email to, to briefings that you gave to um, the government on what, how you, back in 2014 when Labor came in on how you wanted them to perform or what you thought their, your ideas were and what your goals were and your recommendations. Was that right when you briefed yeah. Labor coming in? Yeah, so we briefed Labor and the crossbench in 24, so after the 2014 election. Mm -hmm. Probably the first time the Victorias had a really big crossbench in the upper house as well, and independents and minor parties. Yep. Um, so we put together a briefing with Field and Game on what we saw at the time as the really important issues for shooting and hunting in Victoria. And most of that was focused more on maintaining the status quo yep. than achieving anything new. We were, we were really keen to ensure that we didn't lose anything. Yeah. Um, and we just thought it'd be valuable to look back now, four years later, and, mm -hmm. and some of those priorities have changed for us now. But thought it'd be interesting to look back four years later and see how people have gone against that. So going through that, um, back is one of the key things was the GMA? Yeah. Yeah, and look, the government, look, they haven't got rid of it. They've maintained it roughly where it is. Um, but they haven't fixed some of the big problems with it either. Mm -hmm. um, so. But they didn't create the big problems with the GMA, but by the same token, they didn't fix them. Yep, and some the key one there is the, the management the enforcement issues. Yeah, and that enforcement issue is ongoing and it's unresolved and it's a serious problem for ethical, responsible deer hunters. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an even more serious problem for people in remote communities who are dealing with just criminals yeah. shooting over private property and, and doing criminal things. Mm -hmm. It's a serious issue that needs to be rectified. Yeah. Um, and the same, same goes with duck hunting. There's serious issues with the enforcement with duck hunting. And again, for those that aren't quite aware, and there's a bit of misinformation and understandably, understandably a bit of frustration there, you've got to understand that if people are getting disheartened or dismayed about maybe some of the lack of enforcement, uh, it's, it's not the GMO's, GMA's fault. There's good guys doing the best they can with limited resources there. Yeah. and. This, this is, you know, law enforcement is, uh, in this day and age, there's health and safety, there's all law, laws and regulations and rules involved. And these guys just don't have the legislation in place to go pulling people up and locking them up. Yeah, so for the most part, GMA enforcement officers have got their hand, one hand tied behind their back. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, Victoria Police instituted a policy where police have to work two up. Mm -hmm. So we've now got the situation where GMA officers aren't allowed to go and confront people who are armed, i.e. everybody they're supposed to be talking to. Yep. Um, cause that's not, cause uh, exactly, that's not armed in the sense that they're uh, illegal the, firearm or the, rob someone. No, they're armed people who are in the possession firearm. of firearms. Exactly. Um, so we've got this situation where they're not allowed to go out and talk to people who are in the possession of firearms without a police officer. It's now the situation that the police aren't allowed to go out one up, which means you've now got to have a GMA officer and two police officers and a police vehicle to have the proper comms. Yep. And police have different resourcing issues and different priorities, quite understandably so. Exactly. So it's a resourcing issue. It's, it's, it's a real resource issue and a scoping of, issue. Yeah, yeah. And you find that these crimes, which for a lot of the community are victimless crimes, mm. yeah. Yeah. go by the wayside. Yeah. I was lucky enough to be invited out and do some filming on a, on a, on a GMA sting, if you like, and out in Western Vic. And with the with the GMA guys and joint operation with the police, and it was so impressive to see what they were doing and their commitment to 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 getting the bad guys and looking after the good guys. It's there, but it's yeah, it just needs some funding and some responsibility, and we need the government to do it. So again, please understand the frustration shouldn't be directed at GMA guys on the ground. They, as Baz said, they've got one hand tied behind their back. So let's hope. 
regardless of what happens on Saturday, that this enforcement issue is something that gets sorted out. And we'll touch on there because one of the parties seems to have had a bit of a commitment to that over the other one. Um, on to the Sustainable Hunting Action Plan. Yeah, so the first iteration of this came out about this time in 2014. So in the weeks before the election, uh, the again Minister Peter Walsh released an action plan. Mm -hmm. Um, in, sorry, in summary, for those that don't know, uh, this was a, a, a list of goals and um, yeah, yeah, it, it, to get done for hunting. All the, the, the idea is that it's a whole of government document that outlines the priorities for hunting mm -hmm. and that it, it then places responsibilities on all the ministers across the board yep. and all the different branches of the public service that it touches. It, yep. it, it puts a clear framework mm -hmm. as to what the government expects. So, and it's passed in legislation, so it has to be done. Well, it's not passed in legislation, but it's signed off by all of the relevant okay. ministers and, by, and it's, it's a cabinet document. Uh -huh. So it, it does have to be done. Okay. Um, it was released in Caretaker, which, you know, um, so it didn't really get up and running under that government. Mm -hmm. The, well, but we've since had good success. Well, the yeah. new government came in. Um, they took a little while to get the action plan back up and running again, but they've had it up and running for two years. They've funded it. Yeah. And we're seeing some really good tangible results out of it. Uh -huh. Now, onto the national parks. Um, the inclusion of hunting groups on the forest industry task force, and this is obviously associated with uh, the Great Forest National Park debate yeah. as well. Uh, you've got a cross here. Yeah, so, so Labor went to 2014 with a commitment that that task force that they were going to institute would include all relevant stakeholders, uh, which we took to mean us. Mm -hmm. um, we lobbied pretty hard post-election to be involved in that, and they that was a very narrowly scoped task force as it ended out. So it wasn't just hunters that were excluded. There were a lot of stakeholders that were excluded. Yeah. At the end of the day, the task force didn't achieve anything. Okay. It was to try and find a consensus on these issues and you, you basically had in the room industry on one side and the Green Lobby on the other side and people who are just fundamentally diametrically opposed to each other. Yeah, okay. um, so at the end of the day, us not being on the task force probably, probably wasn't that bad a thing. Mm -hmm. um, we still believe we should have been involved, but being on the outside allowed us to stand back and throw rocks, basically. Yeah, OK, OK. There was a um, Alpine National Park's draft management plan uh, t table to put together, and one of the huge concerns in that was a proposal for no, no firearms in certain camping areas or segregated yeah. camping areas. And we'll talk about that with Daniel um, shortly because he was uh, directly involved in stomping that on the head. That was the start of segregation and maybe we'll leave that for Daniel to talk about yeah, man, yeah but that was stopped yeah and look just we'll wait for Daniel but the important thing is that was an idea that had been around for years and years um, we put that in that paper because there's a tendency when a new government comes in for the uh, public servants to pull the idea out of the bottom shelf and put ah, it in the top shelf gotcha. um, that was our concern and we're proven right right well, well played on that one well played the retention of the Firearms Appeals Committee. Yeah, so the previous parliament leading into 2014 had had legislation which would have got rid of the Firearms Appeals Committee, mm -hmm. which is if you're having your firearms licence suspended, it's an independent review with specialist expertise in firearms rather than going to VCAT or a court. Yep. Uh, that was going to be abolished. It hasn't been. Um, there's been some changes that have probably diminished its role, mm -hmm. but we asked for it to be retained, it's been retained. Yeah. There's been um, a continued budget allocation for the Firearms Safety Foundation. The sports facilities grants um, have, have carried on. Yep. The budget allocations uh, ended last year and there was no allocation for this financial year. But, um, but we've now got both sides promising to do that in the next term of parliament. I did so, see that, yep. yeah, so that's a good thing. Um, the temporary intervention orders, no, no success on that. For, no, no, and it's it's an ongoing issue. Yeah, um, and this is about the reissuing of firearm, firearms licences when you know when yeah, orders so, lapse and things. So, and, and look, it's a really sensitive issue because mm. intervention orders are a really important thing. Yeah. Our issue is that if those orders are put, never even get put before a court, the order lapses, 
the presumption is then on the, the licence holder to go basically back through a court system to get their firearm licence back. Mm. When they haven't committed a crime, the intervention order's never even been tested in court. Um, it, it's a big anomaly that, yeah. that makes it very easy to lose your licence and you know, I'm not arguing for a second that someone who's subject to an intervention order shouldn't have their firearms yeah. taken away whilst yeah. that order's in force. Makes it very easy to take it away and very difficult to get it back. Gotcha. Um, the breeding and rearing code of practice there for hound, for, yeah, for hound breeders. Yeah, and that's an ongoing issue, but we wanted an exemption. Um, there's exemptions for members of Dogs Victoria mm -hmm. from this breeding and re rearing code of practice and some reasonably onerous conditions put on breeders. Gotcha. We put an argument that we're the only cohort of people, well, except for maybe greyhound owners, whose dogs are directly registered with the government. Yeah. The government of Victoria keeps a register of the dogs. Yeah. And if that's not a grounds for exemption, we don't know what is. Yeah, but fair enough. We haven't progressed. So okay. And good to see the, um, the the funding was allocated under the Sustainable Hunting Action Plan for the National Hard Hunting Archive. Yeah, which so. is a, a really important joint venture we've got with Field and Game Australia, mm -hmm. which is a an extraordinary physical collection of, of Max Downs' life work yeah. and a, a database and a, a research facility for people who are looking at the history of game hunting in Australia yeah. uh, going back before white settlement. Yeah. So That's Max nice. looks at the history of, he puts an argument that the Indigenous Australians weren't hunter-gatherers, weren't, um, weren't farmers, they you know, people call them hunter-gatherers. Yeah. Max puts an argument that they were game managers. Yeah. Uh, you know, they were deliberately doing burns to manipulate game harvest. Yeah, yeah. That's something we might have to touch on in a future future episode, yeah. I think. <laughs> so, um, the uh, putting um, putting one against the other here. Um, like you specifically asked some questions, uh, you know, for for a brief. I think it was coming a few months out from the election on on some questions you had answered, some questions you wanted answered, where it was going to go. Um, yeah. So we signed a letter with um, Lucas Grabani Grossi from CIFA, mm -hmm. um, who you know quite well. Uh, Bill Patterson from Field and Game, uh, Jack Wegman from Sporting Shooters Association, myself mm -hmm. signed a joint letter outlining some really basic priorities for shooting and hunting at this election and asking for for commitments. Yep, and where they stood on that. Yep. And uh, Labor, Labor came back to you, they uh, both given, given back to you, but let's quickly go through the through the reply that you got here. Yep. Um, uh, how's it looking from the Labor point of view? Um, look, both sides sort of answered some questions and, and not others. Mm -hmm. So it's a real mixed bag. Um, you, one of your key requests there was commitment to be no changes in land tenure, which would result yeah. in any loss of access for hunters. And, and look, the big ticket item for hunters in that is this Great Forest National Park proposal. Yes. So the coalition are on the record saying they oppose the Great Forest National Park and any changes in this latest VAC. And this is very interesting. Yeah, the, Labor, the Liberal coalition oppose it. Yeah. Now, where are we with Labor? Silence on quiet. that issue. Um, Strangely quiet. But counterbalancing that is a commitment from Labor to address this licensed land access issue, which we spoke about, I think, in the last yep. podcast. Yep. And we haven't been able to get that same commitment out of the coalition. Mm. So there's a bit of for and against. A there. bit of for and against there. But you know, the, these are these are big issues. And the and the question we asked both parties was a commitment that, that there will be no changes in land tenure that would result in any loss of access. And to a degree, neither of them answered that question. Mm. So, yeah, it's just open, it's open in that one. Open in that, but I'd have to say there's some, there's some positives and there is yeah. in in both responses. Yep. And there's some worries in both yeah, responses. Yeah. For me, uh, as we laughed about, you've got to be careful. You deal with these guys yeah. every day about who <laughs> you piss off, essentially, Garvin. Yeah, I like the Liberal Nationals point of view personally, yeah. but anyway, anyway, we'll see how that goes. The, um, obviously you asked for a specific request to realign and resource GMA, was some of the, the, the points we, post, we spoke about just before, so they can work efficiently and effectively for community benefit. Labor have come out with the front foot there with a big statement. Yeah, yeah, um, and quite welcome to increase the staffing by 30%, so yeah. a significant improvement. It is a significant improvement, 30% and on J yeah. Continue to restructure and address structural flaws, that's that's po uh, it's motherhoodie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and what about the coalition? On coalition, 
improved the GMA. So yeah. again, fairly motherhoody. There's, yeah, a bit open, isn't it? Yeah, there's, there's a lack of detail from both sides, and they've got this big promise to move the management of state game reserves to the GMA, which is a good thing. Could be a good thing. Um, will require a lot of money. Yeah, but yeah, certainly something. State game reserves are, are vital for hunters. There's 200 of them in the state, so yep. certainly something we'd fully support. And, and where do they stand on the VFCC? And if you could explain that quickly to right, So the Firearms Consultative yeah. Committee was started back under the Brax Brumby government. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a means for a wide range of stakeholders in shooting to give advice to the minister on issues relating to our use of firearms. Um, it went pretty well under Brax Brumby. It ticked along under the previous government. Um, not sure how well it was listened to, but it ticked along, met regularly. Mm -hmm. It was ticking along pretty well under this government until Lisa Neville came in as minister. And then it all but stopped. Well, it hasn't met in over a year. Right. Um, so that's all going backwards. And we've sat down with both parties and had discussions about um, how they've viewed the Firearms Consultative Committee in the past. Mm. And there's been positives and negatives on both sides, I must say, yep. in how they've used this committee in the past. Yep. And our keen focus was on how it's going to be used going forward. Yep. So the there's past a, is the past. There's a lot of representation at a level, uh, a high industry level there, if I'm CIFA as well, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. so mm. there's industry, there's academics. Um, part of our problem with it is that justice and police have a big presence in that. Mm. And they also get to brief their minister directly. Yep. So at the moment, Justice and Police sort of act as the Secretariat for the Firearms mm. Consultative Committee when it sits. So they're filtering the advice that goes from user groups, yeah. as well as providing their own advice. So that's a, that's a problem we've put to both both parties. And that space is a lot is, is focused a lot around all the all the nitty gritty of your firearms laws, your classifications, your import, your export. Yeah. You know, so the sort of stuff that ODA typically tries to stay out. I know of. a lot of people <laughs> stay out of, but <laughs> the same. My interest in that is zero, but the importance yeah. of it is huge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I know that might seem harsh, but I like to hunt. But without a firearm, yeah, I can't right. hunt. That's right. So it's very important. Uh, the waterfowl harvest seasons. Now, this is an interesting one. This is an interesting one because I saw the message from a buddy from Cam Johnson who sent me a random text that somehow the animal uh, Animals Australia got his number and sent him a kind message saying that we will end. You know, this is a calling out for the election and the Animals Justice Party and in conjunction with Animals Australia will put an end to duck hunting. They will put an end to recreational hunting. It was some pretty harsh statements coming out there. Uh, Duck season again. We'll talk about this shortly with Daniel. It's a big part of uh, a big passion of his, and he um, he's always advocating strongly for that personally and in government. Waterfowl harvest seasons uh, is a big one. It's a big one. Yeah, and there's two broad commitments to duck hunting there, which um, I found interesting. Yeah, very different approaches. So coalition continued support of duck hunting. That's yeah. pretty straightforward. Very vague um, overview. Labor, which is finalisation of the adaptive harvest model, which is already in the hunting action plan to finalise mm -hmm. that. What, what do you define as the adaptive harvest, harvest model? So it's, it's a document that was put together in 2010 by a heap of academics, and it's a it would be a new system to change, basically set the bag limit every year yep. for duck hunting based on game management principles. Science. Based on science. Emotion. Yeah, what but, a, what a, what but a what, was idea. what was missing from that was a decision making mechanism. So this great model, and then you end up with this political process at the end. Yeah, um, and we sort of put that to Labor. That yes, all right, you've, you're promising this, but what's missing is a review of the model and a decision making process. So th mm -hmm. there's a broad commitment to that. It's again, there's not a heap of detail in either of these two letters. Mm. To be honest, it's interesting the reply you got there in the letter, though, that this method will strengthen the scientific basis and continue to take the politics out of determining duck numbers. Yeah, which is a great aspiration for us. It's a big line, yeah. exactly. That's what we can, exactly what we all aspire to: take the politics, which helps take the emotion out of it. And mm. if you look at adaptive harvest in the states, it's tended to favour hunters, mm -hmm. but. The, uh, there could be some pills to swallow for hunters in adaptive harvest too, because yeah. there could be years where it it makes recommendations that aren't what we want to hear. Yes. Um, and there's a lot, you know, I don't want to get into duck hunting's an interest of mine, but we're yeah. a deer hunting organisation. Yes. But, you know, if you look at the long-term average, regardless of what the bag limit is, regardless of what government set as start times 
hunters take three three ducks a day on yeah. opening morning, and that's what happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, a model that would take the politics out of that would be fantastic. It would. And finally, there you requested for the uh, continual um, continuation of the success, successful funding for shooting sports. Yeah, yeah. So the coalition have come back with that they'll re-establish a similar program. Mm -hmm. um, Labor have been a bit more specific and put. Yeah, dollar dollars. figures against that. Mm. So two million dollars there outlined a year from over four labor. years. Yeah, two million dollars a year for four years. And that doesn't affect ADA much because we don't have shooting ranges. Mm. So those grants have typically gone to established ranges mm -hmm. to improve their facilities. Mm. Good to have one in the southeast somewhere. It would be lovely, mm. and that's sort of what we were pushing for. Mm. Um, sort of separate to this was we were saying, well, why don't you have just a big buck commitment to establish a really good range for everyone? But, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll keep not, going on that. Not to be. So, uh, just go through your preferences. You know, in, in summary, uh, keep a look out for a, a video on the RDA uh, Facebook uh, media page as well, with Barry giving a quick summary on how to vote. Please take the, the viewers through that again. On yeah, the look, well, we won't tell you how to vote, yeah. um, except that we do ask people, the Greens Animal Justice Party, as you touched on with that stuff from Cam, mm. They're diametrically opposed. They are opposed to hunting. If they get any power in this state, they'll be trying to use that power oh, yeah. against hunting. So yeah. we'd ask people, when you vote, seriously, seriously consider putting the Greens and the Animal Justice Party last and second last in whichever yeah. order you last. want. But and to look, reiterate that, we all, have an, we all have on our game licence, we tick the box for the reason to... Sorry, on our firearms licence, the reason to own a firearm is for recreational hunting. Yeah. So be warned that take away the recreational hunting and we lose the reason why we can own a firearm. So just words of caution here about just how yeah, vigilantly opposed to what we do these people are and the simple process of voting. So if you can take them through the process of voting so, below the line so the, and how yeah, the preferences work. The, the other thing there's been has been a lot of media coverage of, so there's been a lot in the mainstream, the old media, about preference deals, particularly in the upper house. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot in social media around shooting hunting circles on preference deals. A little bit of that has been well informed. Most of it has been not that well informed. Yeah. But th there's a lot of angst and there's a lot of misinformation about these deals. Um, and our advice to people is if you've got any concerns about them, vote below the line. Yeah. Because if you vote below the line, the only place your preferences go is where you've put them. So in Victoria, you can either put in the upper house, the big sheet ballot paper that you'll get, mm -hmm. you can either put a one for one of the parties above the line, or you can go below the line and number candidates, a minimum of five candidates in order of your preference, up to every candidate on the sheet if right. you like to. Our advice would be not to number every candidate on the sheet because right. don't give a preference at all okay. to Greens Animal Justice Party. Right. So they deserve, it's important they deserve no they mark. They deserve no mark at all. Why, why number them at all? You know, we used to go and number them backwards yeah. so that they had no chance and all sorts yeah. of tricks yeah, like that. Yeah, I think putting them last, but it actually gives them a preference. What Barry is saying then is don't give them anything. So if you vote below the line, you number your minimum of five boxes. And look, keep going if you like until you get to your preferences of major party candidates, just so that you can ensure that your vote doesn't exhaust, that it doesn't go nowhere. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you have all just minor party people, it might end up that your vote just runs, it peters out and doesn't yep. go anywhere. So it's a good idea to number in, uh, until you get to your major party candidates at least. Yep. But all you've got to do is five below the line, it's a valid vote. Mm -hmm. And then take away your, if you've got concerns about preference deals, that takes them away. Gotcha. In the lower house, um, which is where you get all your how to vote cards for, again, there's a bit of angst about where people are putting other people on their how to vote cards. Uh -huh. Simple solution to that is it's your vote. Don't follow the how to vote card. Yep. Put people in the preference that you prefer them. It's quite simple. Take all the angst out of that and just number them how you'd like them numbered. We're going to now cross, hopefully, to Daniel. Uh, Technology you've had a lot is a to, wonderful thing. <laughs> you've had a lot to do with, um, with, with Daniel over time. I've just got to get an earpiece in here so I get my volume up. And uh, give a quick rundown while I dial him in here just to, of how important he's... ADA is an apolitical party. Yeah. He's, you, uh, you're very firm on that stance. But uh, there's no denying the 
the the positive and successful outcomes that the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party have had for Victorian hunters, and in particular Daniel's work. Absolutely, and I think I touched on those in those election communications we put out. There was a bit of angst when the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers guys got elected in 2014, yeah. and we had a bit of concern. I and mean, how's it going to go? Are they going to be trying to tell us what to do? Or um, and I'm really happy to report that all that angst was unfounded. Mm -hmm. Uh, Daniel and Jeff have been fantastic to work with from our perspective. Yep. They've worked in the interests of shooters and hunters in Victoria um, and been really valuable to us doing our advocacy. It's been a resource in Parliament House. It's been a set of eyes and ears on what's going on. There's been tips on, hey, perhaps you should go and speak to this person. Mm -hmm. or, um, and we've really appreciated that they haven't tried to be the experts who'll take over on our issues. Yeah. They've worked really collaboratively with us. Mm -hmm. um, and. You know, let us play to our strengths and then play to theirs. So yeah. it's yeah. been a valuable, yeah, and we are apolitical and we're not partisan political, but we give credit where it's due. Yep. And they've been a positive force for hunting in Victoria, in my view. Well, well said. And uh, we uh, let's not forget Jeff down in, in East Gippsland there. The focus of today, I haven't had time to get everyone in, but the focus of today is catching up with Daniel. Now, I can't. I can't vote for Daniel in my electorate, uh, electorate but um, Northern Victoria is, uh, it's a huge... So the, uh, these are the upper house regions correct. of Victoria? Yep, upper house region. And, and um, for those that don't, uh, aren't familiar with just how big that electorate is, we'll try and put up a graphic uh, over the top of this, but th this is the heartland of, of, of a lot of deer country. And people need to understand that particularly deer hunters, if you're a passionate deer hunter, you've kind of got a responsibility on Saturday to do the right things by everyone else, by people like me, by keeping, uh, by keeping Daniel in there fighting the good fight for us. Places such as the Victorian, you know, the electorate covers uh, the Victorian Alps, Mount Hotham, Falls Creek, over to um, Black Forest, Hang Rock, um, the, the, oh, the towns, Alexandra, Benalla, Bendigo, Cobram, Corriong, Dalesford, into um, yeah, Costa King Lake, Kilmore, Hillsville, right in the area of the Great Forest National Park and yay, some of the hound hunting heartland. It's all there. So let's see if we can... Um... And, and similarly, the other area where the shooters and fishers have members, so Eastern Victoria covers sort of from the peninsula all the way through to Omeo, New South Wales border. So all of that hog deer country and all the rest of the sand. So between the two representatives, they pretty well have covered all of the deer country. Yes, that's very true. And here he is. G'day guys. Hey mate, how are you? Hi Dan. Yeah, good, good. Can you, can you hear uh, Barry okay? He hasn't spoken yet. Check one. Check one, check one. G'day Baz. How are you Dan? Yeah, good, good. You're, uh, <laughs> I know you're a very busy man at the moment. You've been um, campaigning your butt off. You're uh, pulled over in the mobile office there, I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. I've, I'm just on the, I'm actually sitting in the front yard of my parents' place at the moment. Um, I'm about to head up to Wodonga to do a mercy dash up there with how to vote cards and the rest of the gear for, for the campaign in that area. Okay, sorry, I've just got the um, yeah, I've just got the video uh, linked going in there a bit late on that, but that's um, I've got you now. I've got all the audio, which is important. Uh, so where are you? Did you say uh, your, your parents in Romsey? Uh, was yeah, it? I'm, I'm in the driveway of my parents' house after uh, meeting up with one of our volunteers who's getting gear around the north state, and I'm about to do a dash up to Wodonga. Right. Uh, Josh Knight up there is doing a sterling job and uh, doing a run of how to vote cards and call flutes and things for him for, for the big day. So how's the last 48 hours, 72 hours, week been for you leading up to the election? Yeah, uh, long and, uh, and and very tiring. I bet. <laughs> we, we've uh, I've put in basically two weeks of, of um, standing on pre-polls and uh, when I'm not standing on pre-polls outside of office hours, I'm trying to arrange for, for people to be doing work on the day and... and uh, that's in between media stuff and, and talking to people like yourselves and a lot of social media stuff that we have to do. So it's uh, it's never ending and I'm, I'm about to fall over and fall asleep for a little while. Well, you're nearly there, mate. Uh, 48, 48 hours to go. Uh, Barry, was we were just discussing the great work you've done uh, in, in the lead up into to getting, you, getting you on here. So trust me, we haven't thrown you under the bus there in the edit beforehand. Uh, I was pointing out to um, a lot of the viewers that aren't familiar with your electorate and just how large it is, and, and Barry also uh, confirmed that, that it covers a lot of the 
you know, the deer heartland here. And you are the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. You have got a lot of, uh, you're a political party like everyone else. You've got greater issues and greater policies. We are going to focus just on the hunting ones because that's what the audience is interested in today. So yep. I will ask you to, to try and stay focused on that. I know you've probably got a lot to talk about, but hey, look, you're a keen diehard hunter at heart. I know you're a really keen duck man. Um, Let's go through some of your personal achievements in the four, four years. It's been a big four years for you. We're so proud and happy to, to get uh, to get two members in at last election. What's been your, your favourite moments so far, I suppose? Um, favourite, so it's interesting that you've just had that talk about other issues um, in the lead up to that question because personally, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm going to walk away from the last four years with, with one thing that I'm really proud of, and that's actually the uh, work that I did on the CFA legislation. Yes. Uh, so, you know, you're right, we are a political party like all others and we may have our niche where we, we um, look after shooters and fishers and farmers. Yep. Uh, we have to be across all sorts of pieces of legislation, so... No, well, uh, Andrew, I film with on Beyond the Divide is a um, is a CFA full-time employee and my drummer in my band, Marty, he's another fiery, so yeah, your work hasn't gone unnoticed there. <laughs> yeah, I doubt it has. Uh, but look, in, in the hunting space, um, I suppose what we're most proud of is just being able to bring the issues to the floor of Parliament. Um, so often you get people talking about hunting regulation and, and laws that, are, that surround firearms owners, uh, but people in Parliament don't have any idea. They've never had any practical experience with firearms. They've never been out hunting, so they have to make decisions based on you know, what we do and things that are, impact, are going to impact us uh, without any actual knowledge on it. So being able to stand up in Parliament um, and, and voice that opinion, the opinion of all of the hunters I know and, and me myself, um, that's pretty important because they get to hear firsthand what it's like for us. For sure, for sure. And that's just an opportunity we haven't had before. Uh, some of the key uh, topics and what, one we were talking about before that um, I guess it was a proposal that is uh, that has been nipped in the bud and a fire that has been put out was the very nasty uh, proposal of the uh, exclusion zones for camping in, in national parks. Yeah, that was an interesting one. Um, sort of came out of the blue for us as well. Uh, we had a, a review of the um, Alpine uh, Park Management um, and, and a, a couple of drafts were put together and I was, I was scanning through it and I had a couple of people approach me about it. But we came across this nasty little part in it uh, that was going to put an exclusion zone around uh, campsites. Mm -hmm. I know it's talking about the Alpine National Park and, and there are many, many areas where you can't take firearms in anyway, so... There's an effective exclusion zone. Uh, but there are a lot of areas where you can. Uh, there's a lot of areas where we do hunt. And if we're going to have a system that makes you camp in specific spots, it's pretty stupid to have hunting areas where the only place you can camp is a spot you can't take fire. Yeah. So we stepped in and, uh, and approached the minister's office and said, hey, we need to have a look at this and uh, managed to turn that around in a pretty short amount of time. Um, the reality is that it's bigger than just the issue that was the management plan for that part. Uh, we just don't want those kind of things setting a horrible precedent. Uh, pretty soon we could have that rolled out of, uh, over all parks. Um, yeah. So they're kind of things that we have to get on top of very early. Uh, yeah. And we managed to do it. And, and Barry and I had some pretty good conversations around that at the time. And, um, yeah, we, we managed to get a good outcome. And obviously just the, um, yeah, the bones of it was was segregation it's the sharp end it's the thin edge, thin edge of the wedge wasn't it in pushing us out really yeah that's right um you know there's always a thin edge of the wedge um with these issues uh it, it's interesting sometimes we have an issue that people may think oh that's not so bad it's, it's it's only a little bit that we're losing uh but we lose a little bit every time it never goes back the other way yeah, yeah and, and you're right the practical effect of that probably wouldn't have been huge but the message that would have sent that hunters are somehow not able to coexist mm. in a campsite with other bush users was terrible. Yeah, it was horrible. And, and yeah. it was a really close rung thing. You know, Cole Brumley and I were at a meeting with Parks Victoria with their CEO who was adamant that this was going ahead. Mm. And yeah, we walked out and I've rung Daniel and gone, you know, we're in the, in the poo here. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it didn't go ahead and it's, it was a, a really great thing that was stopped. Mm. And sometimes your best, big achievements are things that didn't happen as much as things that did happen. Very good point. Very good point. Yeah, and, and especially on the messaging, um, you know, we saw at the time we, we were asking questions about um, hunting being allowed in some of these parks, and and the, the messaging that we were getting from the current, well, not the current, the, the at the time environment minister, 
was that hunting wasn't compatible. And they were the kind of words that were being used. And, yeah. and that was the kind of uh, phrases that were thrown around with this issue as well, is that firearms weren't compatible with a campsite, yeah, which is a, just the case. Not a nice word, is it, compatible? <laughs> No. no. Well, uh, Snake Island, Barry. Yeah, so th- we touched on this, well, we went into this in a bit of detail in the last podcast, Rob, but um, yeah, and, and I went through the critical role that Daniel and Jeff played in, in us getting access to Snake Island. I stand here, I'll sit here completely convinced that had those two blokes not put that up, we hunters would not be on Snake Island, and that's an ongoing thing now. Um, that's a really tangible legacy from your first term in Parliament is something that hunters have been fighting for for a quarter of a century. Mm. Yeah, uh, uh, my apologies. I haven't actually watched your last podcast. No, no have... worries, mate. Give me the word to the last You've time. You've been busy or something. Yeah. <laughs> Had your hands full. What are you doing? Um, but, yeah, no, look, Snake Island, to be honest, is uh, something that has been fought for a long, long time, and we came to it very late in the piece. Um, and, and personally, I wasn't even aware of it as an issue. I wasn't aware of it as, as something that deer hunters had been fighting for. Um, it, it sat outside... Um, the, the groups that I hung around with and, and the ADA and, and Barry brought it to us and we thought, well, okay, we've got to do something about this. So um, put in a pretty hard campaign over a relatively short amount of time and, and managed to get the government to come on board. Um, they're still maintaining it's a trial, uh, but we'll push past that. We'll make it permanent. That, that's all right. Very uh, good. Make- oh, it's, oh. Been a, it's been a huge win. And, you know, in the deer circles that I'm involved in, particularly Barry and in a hunting shop here, you know, to see the looks on people's faces as they come in uh, or gear up or have come in and checked in after their hunt, you know, and been on that wilderness experience is pretty special. And uh, we just got to hope we can draw one day. <laughs> um, <laughs> the amendments to the GMA is another is another key component of what you're trying to do and, and have done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the GMA is a really interesting one. So uh, the authority that's whose responsibility is to administer game hunting uh, was set up by the last government, so, uh, the, the coalition government. And it was set up very late in their term, and um, it was great that it got set up. Um, it's something we'd, we'd needed for a long, long time. Uh, but we feel that it, it's sort of a, a shell authority. It doesn't you know, really have any substance. Um, there's been a lot of things that we want the GMA to do, that we want them actively uh, engaged in, like you know, management of state game reserves. And because of the way the legislation was, they weren't able to. Then we had this government, which took a different approach to fishing. Um, they've got a pretty good fishing policy. They've mm-hmm. done a lot of work in that space. A lot. Uh, including up a statutory authority for fishing. Now, when that legislation came through, it was sensational. It uh, did all the things that we wanted it to do. It, had all, it gave the fishing authority all the abilities that it needed to be a big player in fishing. And to be honest, we see hunting as no different. Both, both are just you know, forms of harvesting a wild animal with the use of a tool. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, to me, fishing and hunting are no different at all. Uh, so we asked the questions about why the GMA isn't set up in the same way. Um, got to the point where I decided to write my own bill on it, which was uh, pretty good. It was the second bill that I'd done. Um, takes a lot of work to write a, to write a bill and, and a lot of months of work. And um, Unfortunately, the government wasn't really in line with, with our views on what the GMA should be, um, and they uh, decided to vote it down. There was a little bit of to and fro after that where I managed to also get the same amendments up to one of the government's bills. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a little bit of uh, a, a play inside the parliament. We're just using another process to actually get our legislation across. Um, and this government was so adamant not to do it that they actually threw away their own bill for the sake of it. Hmm. Um, now, that could have been a huge boon for, for hunters. Um, it, it could have enabled the GMA to have active management roles to be more involved in where water goes when, when we're doing environmental watering to make sure that it coincides with um, duck seasons and things like that to get the best bang for our buck out of it um, and a more active role in, in so many areas of game management um, so it's a fight that you know we haven't finished and certainly something i'll take up again um, next time yeah well very good very good to hear the great forest national park barry's working hard on it and it's, a, it's on the tip of everyone's tongue we're all worried about it uh where is it? Where is it going? What's your stance? Um, so I, I hope I don't have to tell you too what the Great Forest National Park proposal is. I'm pretty <laughs> confident about that. Yeah. But for anyone who doesn't know, and, and I, I still am surprised uh, when people tell me they don't know, it's a proposal to turn 355,000 hectares of mostly state forest into national park. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's Central Highlands, so it's quite a huge area. 
Yeah, we uh, did go into the detail on it last week, so I think everyone's up to speed on it. I suppose I'd guess in, in the essence of time, just like you to give us your insight on where you think it might be going with the parties and or how do you think you're going to fight it? Yep, yep. So we've managed to, to nip it in the butt at the moment uh, because I put up a, a motion to Parliament um, for a moratorium on it, mm-hmm. um, a motion that would not allow it to go past. Uh, again, the government voted against me, but we managed to get the numbers enough that, that it was a tied vote, which means any uh, legislation by the government to create it would also meet a tied vote. So that was a huge step. It put it off. Um, because it put it off, the government's been really dicey about their position on it. And this is where uh, I get worried because we might be staring down the barrel of a Greens Labor coalition after this election. And that's just going to be disastrous. I, I don't, we, we don't have enough time uh, in, in, in the next few months to talk about all the bad things that will come out yeah. of that, mm. let alone today. Mm. Uh, but in terms of the Grey Forest National Park, the, the government are dicey. They, they won't put their foot down on a position. And the reason is they have to keep their mind open uh, to a Greens coalition. Um, and besides that, I think they're internally conflicted. I think half of the Labor Party want it. Um, certainly a majority of the Labor Party want it. That's why we haven't got a position against it. Mm. So that's the danger. We, we, we uh, managed to get the coalition locked into a position, and that's great. Um, but the government dodged it every time. There was a yeah, we did discuss that with, with Barry just earlier. They, they made a clear statement on it, the coalition, but the, uh, the yeah, Labor's left the, the door open, if you like. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And, and it's just a, it's a horrible proposal. It's, it's designed to stop logging, um, mm. and, and that's a discussion in itself. But the impacts that a national park across that area would have on all of the other rec activities that go on, uh, particularly hunting. You know, there's yep. so much deer hunting in that area. Yeah. You know, um, as Barry pointed out in the last podcast, you know we we haven't we've never had um, access or hound hunting access in a national park. So if that national park's created, there's the precedent that really kicks it out the door. Yeah, well, most national parks can't even take your dog in for a walk, mm, so yep. um, they allow us to do hound hunting. Yeah, that's it. Um, but you can we can have all the promises in the world around consultation to allow certain activities in certain areas, but it goes back to what we talked about before, being the thin edge of the wedge. Um, you know, we're always losing ground and, and you know, we're not going to stand for it. Shooters, Fish and Farmers have been the only party that uh, throughout the entire last four years, the entire of this term, has been against the Great Forest National Park. Um, so we'll keep fighting that and I'll do everything I can to stop it. Very good, very good. And I know you're a keen, passionate duck hunter at heart and ducks... Uh an issue that never goes away. Thanks to all our uh, thanks to all our friends that uh, that are vigilantly and ide- ideologically opposed, as, as Barry pointed out, to what we do. Um, how's it looking for, for for duck seasons and future duck seasons, and where are you going on that? Yeah, it's been um, it's been an interesting four years on that too. Mm. Uh, we've had modifications every year by this government, and to be honest, I don't think the uh, conditions or survey numbers have been so extreme that have warranted modifications. Uh, but they also ha- have gone down the path of having a process every year, uh, almost like a, a full of, full-blown consultation process every year mm. to decide on whether to have a season or, or whether it's going to be modified. And that's just ridiculous. We need to go back to having a full season, full bags, for a consistent period of time um, and take some good, accurate data off of that. Um, ch- chopping and changing it every year based on political values is just ridiculous and that, that's what this government done every single year yeah. the worst of it was the last duck season we just had um, where there was a few regulations brought in um, in order to address an issue from from the year before and that included changing the start time of the season um, you know the reality is changing the start time didn't change people's behavior talking about it changed people's behavior yeah uh, mm. the start time was changed um, so people were on the ball yeah. um, but this government has taken it, 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 they've taken the actuals every year and again it's a case of being slowly chipped away at um, Greens Labor Coalition geez, uh, duck hunting is seen as the low hanging fruit as far as anti-hunting goes um, they think it's the most vulnerable that's why they campaign so not so hard on it all the time yep. uh, it's easy to run a campaign that's visual on duck opening oh uh, so yeah yeah, they, they, they take it every year I, I think I think back and shudder to two years back when it was the uh, the billboards and the messages on buses with the kids and they're shooting with their dads with the next generation of murderers, you know, put out by Animals Australia. That's, you know, if you yeah. didn't catch that, or if you haven't seen it, that's the kind of stuff we're dealing with here. So, well, yeah. again, keep keep fighting the fight. You're in uh, there doing it. And, and we've had, you know, you get various parties sort of feeling out our position as deer, deer hunters on it. We've been yeah. consistent in saying that duck hunting is the canary in the coal mine as far as we're concerned. Mm. 
yeah. if it goes, you know, so too do we. Yeah, what's next? Um, yeah, we're all in it together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's a, it's a, it's a uh, very slow process, but they'll, they'll chip away at them all. Duck hunting goes, then, then deer hunting will go, then pest hunting will go. And, and next, next on the chopping block's fishing, you know? Mm. Parties like the Animal Justice Party, um, they, they want all forms of, of that kind of harvest gone. Fishing will be next. If people yeah. don't think it is, then they're, they're blinded by it. On that note, you're working on something very interesting uh, around a right to hunt and fish and access public lands. Yeah, so we started talking about this notion a little while ago. Um, we have a, a really weird sort of uh, system of laws where we don't actually have rights for the most part. Um, and, and I started talking about what we see as a right to, to be able to hunt and a right to be able to fish. Um, and it got taken... Uh, pretty literally by a lot of people, mm. uh, which is great because it, it's it sparked so much emotion. So so many people were, were just in love with this this idea of having a legislated right to. Yeah, to it's be able fascinating. To. Yeah. Um, now it, it snowballed a little bit, um, and I started having discussions more broadly about uh, a right for access. Um, public lands for us uh, belong to the public, and there's no good having these beautiful, pristine, uh, natural places if we can't enjoy them. Um, and to me, the value is in its use. Uh, we, we look after these places because we use them and we need them to be looked after to be in the right state for what we use them for. Mm. Um, so, you know, having a right to access and a right to hunt uh, is something that's pretty important to me. Now, putting that in terms of legislation or regulations a bit more difficult. Mm. Um, it could be just simply a, a set of regulations or, or a, a, a piece of legislation that would make it very difficult to modify um, the, the, the things that we do, so season arrangements and, and um, where we can go to hunt, those kind of things. Um, if it was an impact on, uh, on our right, uh, there's certain extra steps that a government has to go through, not just to be able to change them at the whim of a minister um, or, or through political activism uh, making their decision. So just really knuckling down on, on how the process is, uh, go, how the government goes through the process to make those decisions and making it harder for them to do it without uh, justification. Mm. Uh, so mm. that, that's what we, we mean when we talk about uh, our rights, mm -hmm. um, making it harder for people to take away our rights. Yeah, well, that had really sp uh, struck a chord with you on public access, yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's what we're all about is mm. access to public land. Mm. Well, good luck with that, Dan. I wish that's an uh, exciting proposition. We hope to get to, uh, to push it further. Yeah, well, that, that's um, something that I'll, I'll push really hard in the next term um, and have a look at how we can put it into some practical uh, terms as far as you know, maybe putting a, a piece of legislation to the parliament, another private member's bill. Mm. Well, I know you've got to keep moving, but uh, uh, the floor's yours, mate. What have you got to say <laughs> leading up to big game on Saturday? Oh, look, just um, I, I will give a shout-out to everyone who's been uh, supporting us and helpful and, and uh, particularly to Barry, and, and thanks to you, Rob, for having me on today. Um, it's been a really difficult four years, but it's been a really exciting four years for the party. Um, we were only registered just before registration closed at the last election. So we sort of came out of nowhere and got our two members. Now we've had four years of doing hard work, getting runs on the board. Um, I'm excited by what we've done. Uh, I think yeah. we've got a uh, But, you know, it, it's, it's scary when you look at the major parties and how they treat us. Um, I, I haven't been treated well by this government over the last four years. Uh, both personally and politically. Um, so, you know, it, it, that, their views on hunting are, are really, really worrisome for me. Um, I would like to see a change in government and, and certainly to everyone out there, vote shooters, fishing and farmers first and put the Greens bloody last. Yeah, well, that's simple, easy done. All right, well, let's finish on that, mate. Thanks so much for your time and uh, we Great. sincerely wish you a good luck yeah, for Good luck for Saturday, mate. Yeah, no worries. Cheers, guys. See you, mate. Well, some interesting thoughts there. Yeah, I'm moving yeah. forward. Uh, oh, well, ever the underdog, isn't it? The shooters, and far shooters, fishers and farmers. I don't think anything's changed there, but um, again, appealing to every everyone in uh, the electorates of, of Jeff and Daniel to, to support them uh, as best we can and keep our mission going. Is there anything else you want to add, mate? Um, no, no, just take your vote seriously. Make, yep. sure, make sure you do go and vote and take it seriously. And, and like you touched on, there are a number of issues important to people and everybody's different.
But don't be flippant about it. R regardless of where hunting sits on your list of priorities, mm -hmm. it's a real privilege that we've got in this country to vote. Mm. Um, you know, there's people, it's, it's a cliche, but there's people in places all over the world who you know, go and die for the privilege that we've got. It's not a big yeah. price to pay to front up once every four years yeah. and just spend a half an hour or so putting some serious consideration into what numbers you put in those boxes. Yeah. All right, well, on that note, thank you again for your time, mate. Thanks, I look Rob. forward to catching up again with some hopefully some positive news and moving always ever onwards and upwards with ADA. Yeah, look forward to some of the podcasts being a bit more hunty and a bit <laughs> yes, less political that's too. that's exactly right. <laughs> well, we can't get any more heated than now, yeah. so I think it's all hunting from here on forward. Right, cheers. Cheers, buddy.